Okay, let's get started. So this is uh, lecture 13 of Computer Science 162. And uh, we're going to start first with a, one of our quick little quizzes. And it looks like I need to restart my PowerPoint again. It's a really weird bug with PowerPoint where it uh, seems to lose all the fonts. All right, let's try it again. There we go. Okay, so quick quiz. We've got five questions. So first question. With an asynchronous interface, the writer may need to block until uh, the data is written. Second question. Interrupts are more efficient than polling for handling very frequent requests. Third question. Segmentation fault is an example of asynchronous exception or trap. Fourth question. Direct memory access is more efficient than programmed I.O. for transferring large volumes of data. And our fifth question is, in an I.O. subsystem, the queuing time for request is 10 milliseconds, and the request service time is 40 milliseconds. The total response time of the request is blank milliseconds. All right, so let's start with the first one. With an asynchronous interface, the writer may need to block until the data is written. So how many people think that is true? Okay, how many people think that's false? Good. You know what asynchronous is. So asynchronous means you don't block. So answer is false. Uh, question number two. Interrupts are more efficient than polling for handling very frequent requests. So how many people think that is true? Okay, how many people think that's false? Ah, you guys are doing great. All right, so that is indeed false, right? Uh, interrupts are very good if we have something infrequent. Polling is what we want to use if we have something frequent because we don't have the overhead of all the context switching that occurs when you have uh, interrupts. Okay, question number three. Segmentation fault is an example of a synchronous exception or trap. How many people think that is true? Okay, how many people think that's false? Good, that's true. Uh, when you have a segment fault, you are immediately going to trap into the kernel. You cannot block that, stop it, or prevent it from happening. Okay, question number four. Direct memory access is more efficient than programmed I.O. for transferring large volumes of data. How many people think that is true? Awesome. And false. Awesome. Okay. That is indeed true. Right? Uh, direct memory access is what we can use when we want to transfer, say, a large block of data from the disk into memory or vice versa or to the network card. It doesn't require any CPU overhead other than setting up uh, the request. After that, the CPU is free to do something else. Yeah, question? Uh, programmed I.O. would mean where you were doing like loads and stores with the CPU or doing input-output instruction. Okay, last question. In an I.O. subsystem, the queuing time for a request is 10 milliseconds and the request service time is 40 milliseconds. The total response time of the request is 50 milliseconds. Great. You guys are going to do really well on next week's midterm. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? So we're going to talk about uh, hard drives and solid state drives. And then we're going to talk about some of the uh, Im very important storage policies that we want to have in a system and the access and usage patterns uh, for a, um, a, a file system. And then we're going to talk about some of the data structures in a file system. And we're going to actually go through an example of uh, the world's most commonly used file systems. So we you can see if you can guess what that is. So first, let's start with what we store our data on. We store our data on hard drives. So hard drives have a, a, a long history. Uh, IBM spent uh, 10 years developing the first Winchester technology hard drive, and uh, it took them a billion dollars to do that. So it really was a, a moonshot kind of uh, research project for, for IBM. Uh, but the result has been a proliferation of drives uh, of all sorts of varying sizes, ranging from uh, drives like this uh, three and a half inch drive all the way down to micro drives. So one of the first uh, commercial drives that was available was uh, for, any, uh, for customers, um, for businesses and, and consumers, small businesses and consumers, was the IBM personal computer back in 1986, so probably before everyone was born, um, stored a whopping 30 megabytes. That's megabytes, not gigabytes, megabytes. Uh, cost $500, had a 
uh, 30 to 40 millisecond seek time, and we'll talk about what that means in a, in a little bit, but that's a really large amount of time, and could transfer between 700 kilobytes and a megabyte per second, roughly. About a decade later, in the mid-90s, IBM introduced uh, the microdrive. The microdrive is a little compact flash size drive with a platter in it that's the size of a quarter. And these, this store, you know, the original one was 30 megabytes. These, here's one at 512, 1 gigabyte, and 4 gigabyte sizes that they ultimately produced. Primarily, these went into, into tablets and um, into uh, cameras. I think the original MacBook Air had, had one of these. <coughs> So how many people have uh, taken their computer and opened it up and, and looked inside at a, at a hard drive and actually taken the hard drive apart? That's all? Okay. Well, why don't we do that today? So um, I have a variety of different drives. Not all of them I can hand out. So here's, here's a drive, for example, that's in a bag because um, the way hard drives work is on the Bernoulli principles. You spin the disk really, really fast. The head's really small and light, and you'll get to see what the heads look like in a moment, and it floats on a little cushion of air. Now, if you drop your computer or uh, otherwise uh, subject it to high torque or other things like that, you can cause that head to contact uh, the media. And when that happens, all your bits get scraped off, and then you put your drive in a bag like this so it doesn't make a big mess. Okay. So like I said, I have a whole variety of different sizes. And my only request is that I actually get these back. So Kevin's sitting in the back. Uh, I have a lot of valuable data on these. And if you really want one of these drives, I have many of them, so I can give you one. But it's good if I get them back, because then I can use them for, uh, for next semester. OK. so. As you're looking at these, what are some of the properties? So some of the properties of these drives are they're a set of platters. This is where your data lives, OK, is on these platters. They're um, typically aluminum or in, in some very high-end enterprise drives. They're, they're made out of high-strength cer ceramics. And uh, they're coated with uh, ferromagnetic material. Okay? And then we have a head, a thin film head which is the thing that's floating above the drive and actually uh, writes on the drive. Then um, on the bottom of the drive, you'll see there's a large motor which actually spins this thing at high, high speed. And there's another large motor which moves the heads back and forth. Okay? So we take our drive, we take our platters, our, each of these uh, surfaces, and uh, we divide it up into concentric rings. Those concentric, concentric rings are tracks. We take each track and we divide it up into sectors. Okay? Now, an operating system, that's the, the sector is the smallest addressable unit on a drive. The operating system groups those sectors into blocks, and that's the unit of transfer for the operating system. So you transfer a block at, at a time, which is one or more uh, sectors. Now, um, we have random access. So this thing is always spinning. We can go to any position on any of the platters uh, of this drive by uh, moving the arm back and forth and waiting for the drive to rotate around to the appropriate location. So access is either sequentially or uh, random access to anywhere on the drive. Now, typical numbers, and these are always horrible out of date because they change literally every uh, few months, is that you have somewhere between 500 to 20,000 tracks per surface. So those little micro drives, they're not going to have a lot of tracks. Uh, a larger drive like this will have a lot more uh, tracks on it. And each track, We'll have anywhere from 32 to 80, 800 rather uh, sectors on it. Now, uh, you might notice that if you're closer to the center, the track is actually a lot smaller in area than if you're at the outside. So most modern drives do what's called zone bit recording. So they keep the density of bits constant across the entire platter. This allows you to cram the maximum number of bits into the drive. So what it means is that if you look at the center of the drive, there's going to be uh, fewer bits stored here. So fewer sectors in the center. The outside of the drive will have a lot more sectors. Right? Um, 
Older drives, uh, like floppy drives and all on, on Apple IIg S's or app, uh, the original Macs, they actually uh, were floppy drives and they actually spun the disk at different speeds depending on the track location. That's how they maintained a, a constant bit density. Modern drives, they, they just vary it automatically uh, with the drive electronics. Uh, the drive spins at a fixed speed. Okay, so some more characteristics. So we can take, uh, if we take all of the tracks on all of the surfaces of all of the platters that are under a head at any given time, that forms a cylinder, okay? So that's all the, the, uh, the, all the tracks under all the surfaces, uh, all, all the track under all of the surface, on all the surfaces under all of the heads, all right? Now, reading and writing is going to be a three-stage process. So the first part of the process is we actually have to move the arm. So we're gonna move the arm to the appropriate track. That is our seek time, okay? Now, once we have it on the appropriate track, we have to wait for the drive to spin all the way around until the proper sector is under the head. That's our rotational delay. And then, once that's the case, we just read the bits off the disk, or we write the bits to the drive, and that's our transfer time, okay? So those are the three components of uh, the physical side of the drive. Now, there's more time associated with uh, reading and writing from a drive. The total time is, first we actually have to uh, deliver the, the uh, request to the operating system and it gets queued up and, and processed by a device driver. Then it gets sent to the hardware controller and that's the, the big chip on the back of this, like this one uh, from Texas Instruments that says DSP because it's the digital signal processor that does all of the, the data extraction the signal processing, and, uh, and then it's the media time. So again, the time to wait for us to seek to the appropriate track, wait for the appropriate sector to rotate under, and then uh, transfer the contents of the sector. Okay. So the highest bandwidth that we're gonna get out of a drive is when we're transferring a group of blocks sequentially from one track. Okay, anything else is gonna be slower. So, yeah, question? So a, a cylinder, the question is what is a cylinder? So a cylinder is if I take the, the head and I move it to a particular track, if I look at all the tracks that are under all of the heads, so in this case I have one, two, three, four, five, so I've got 10 heads. So the 10 tracks that are under the heads form a cylinder. You're reading from one track at a time, that's correct. And then, but the, the key thing is uh, you can actually switch reading from one track to, one head to another head very quickly. So it's just switching an amplifier to connect the amplifier to that head or to, to a different head. Uh, so it's electronic as opposed to a physical time like waiting for something to rotate around. Okay, so some typical numbers. Uh, average seek times, uh, and so, these numbers will vary wildly depending on the size of the drive and how much you pay for the drive. So if you buy a drive that's in a very low-end uh, laptop, it's gonna be a lot slower, or in a low-end desktop, it's gonna be a lot slower than the kinds of drives that we use in uh, the second floor machine rooms in Soda Hall to store you know, the department's files and to store all, the, all your project files. So uh, typical seek times, five to 10 milliseconds. And uh, depending on actual, the, how closely you're seeking, it could be a lot lower. Um, this is physics, right? So you have to remember like F equals MA, you remember all of that stuff. Uh, you actually, this thing has mass, and so you have to accelerate it up to speed to go from one part of the disk to another part, and you have to decelerate so you don't overshoot the track. So there's a lot of complex, uh, you know, sort of um, uh, algorithms here as to how quickly you can accelerate and how quickly you can decelerate. Okay, um, average rotational delay. So uh, laptop and desktop drives typically rotate somewhere between uh, 3,600 to 7,200. I'd say most are probably 4,500. The, the higher end drives will be 7,200 RPM. Uh, and that gives you a, a, a rotational delay of 16 to eight milliseconds. Of course, 
For the average, you only have to wait for the thing to come around halfway, because on average, when you get to the track, the sector you're looking for is going to be halfway around. So you can cut those numbers in half. Um, drives that we use in, in server environments, they spin at 15,000 RPM, revolutions per minute. All right? um, you probably don't want to stand next to a big chunk of metal spinning at that speed. Those platters, like I said, are typically made out of ceramics. So uh, if they do fail, they're contained by the, uh, by the drive's frame. But that's also part of the reason why these things have such massive uh, chassis is because if the disk does fail, you don't want it going flying all over the place. Um, and then controller time, this will depend on the hardware. So higher end drives will have powerful processors. Uh, lower end drives will have uh, weaker processors. Yeah, question? Yes, it does. So is there one way to measure, like if you have multiple disks, is there one edge and then there's somehow like three blue, blue and the other edge to get to the disk somehow? I mean, sorry, maybe three is slightly exaggerated, but is there like an edge actually, a bunch of edge that make up the sum of the three? Yeah, that's a very good question. So the question is, uh, do we have, uh, are we reading through the disk with these multiple heads or um, do we have one giant head or do we have individual heads? We have individual heads. Uh, so if you look at the top of uh, the drive, you can actually see how small, actually this head fell off, but you can see how small the head is. So that's why uh, here there's actually a stack. So here's one head, right, and there's the, the uh, counter uh, cantilever mechanism. There's another head under here. There's another head here. There's another head under here. There's another head here. Okay, so each surface has its own head, and each surface has its own set of tracks. So the way we can increase the amount of data that we can store in a drive, one way, is by adding more platters. So here's a, a set of, a large set of platters. This is from a much larger drive, whereas this is a much thinner drive. It only has three platters, right? Whereas this one has, I don't know, like eight platters, okay? So what happens is uh, those heads are all connected to uh, an amplifier, and we can switch, um, a MUX actually, we can switch the amplifier for the head from one head to the other. Yeah, that, that's correct. So there's, we read from one head at a time. Um, there have been, you know, sort of Rube Goldberg kinds of, uh, of proposals to have multiple arms, uh, but you get into a lot of airflow problems and, it, it, and vibration issues and such uh, so, sorts of things. So of the heads that you have, you read from one head at a time. And the, part of the other reason is that you've got one DSP. So you can only read from one track process the data from that track, then you can switch the head to, uh, switch the amplifier to a different head, read that data, and so on, without having to move the arms. And is there ever going to be a top and bottom of the disk? Like, it's always, they're always reading the top of the disk. Like, if you have, like, two arms that run one disk, but the bottom is only 0.7%. That, that's exactly what we have. So there are, each, each of these arms is talking, it, it, each of these arms here has a head that goes up and a head that goes down. So. Both sides of every platter have a, a, a head on it. Sometimes the bottom platter doesn't or the top platter doesn't, or on older drives they used it um, for servo information, so you could uh, do fine-grained positioning. But today we try to use every surface. Um, it's critical. We're, we're trying to pack as much data as possible onto these. So uh, here's, another, here's another way sort of, of looking at it. Right, the heads are like a comb that touches you know, each surface and floats above each of the surfaces. Any other questions? Okay. So uh, controller hardware is going to depend on how much money you pay. Uh, higher end drives will have a more powerful processor and be able to, to process data faster. Uh, cheaper drives will have a lower quality processor and lower performance processor. Um, transfer times will range from 50 to 100 megabytes uh, per second is typical. The transfer size is usually a sector which could be anywhere from uh, 512 bytes to, to actually the sector sizes are getting a lot larger. They're now um, I think up to 4 kilobytes or, or even sometimes 16 kilobytes on some of the really massive uh, drives. Uh, rotation speed again is, is anywhere from 3600 to 1500 RPM. 
The recording density, the, the sort of bits per inch uh, uh, on a track will vary widely also. Again, you know, the higher end drives will have a much higher uh, recording capability. Uh, originally, the magnetic domains were, were arranged um, flat, sort of like, you know, flat stones. Um, and then they realized they could actually pack more data if they arranged them vertically, like a set of pencils on end. So the cells are getting smaller and smaller that they're storing your, your information in. And diameters range from the size of a quarter uh, up to typical is five and a quarter for the, the largest size. Um, probably the sweet spot is, is two and a half or three and a half inch drives. Costs drop at you know, exponential rates. Um, performance doesn't change that quickly. Performance kind of improves on a decade by decade basis because it's physics. But the, the cost uh, drops uh, very rapidly. So even this number is, is kind of off. Um, it's a little, I think it's a little bit higher than that because there was floods last year and, and that took out a lot of capacity. But um, it's, a, it's under a, a, a penny, per, uh, under a dime rather per, per gigabyte. Okay, so performance wise, um, let's go through some simple examples. So we're gonna ignore the queuing times, ignore the controller time from now. We're just gonna worry about uh, the seek, the rotational delay and the transfer time. We're going to assume an average seek time of five milliseconds, a rotational uh, latency of eight milliseconds, uh, and a transfer rate of four megabytes per second. Okay, sector size of one kilobyte. So let's say we want to read from a random place on the disk. Right, so again, what do we have to do? We have to seek to that location. Right, we're going to move the arm. That's going to take us five milliseconds. We have to wait on average for half of the disk to rotate around. So that's going to take us four milliseconds, so half of the eight. And then we have to transfer the sector, which a transfer rate of four megabytes per second and a sector size of one kilobyte is gonna take a quarter of a millisecond. All right, so total time to do that transfer is going to be nine and a quarter milliseconds or roughly 10 milliseconds. So we have a, tra a, a transfer rate of, uh, to a random place on the disk of 100 kilobytes per second. Anybody see something wrong with that? We're paying for a drive that's supposed to give us, it says on the label, transfer rate, four megabytes per second, and we're only actually getting 100 kilobytes per second out of it. So that's really bad. So we can do a little bit better if we stay on uh, the same cylinder. Okay, because if we stay on the same cylinder, we just have to wait, we don't have to seek, we just have to wait for the disk to rotate. And so now we just have the rotational delay, which is four milliseconds, plus the transfer time, which is a quarter of a millisecond. So four and a quarter milliseconds, or approximately five milliseconds. So we've doubled our transfer rate from 100 kilobytes to a whopping 200 kilobytes per second. Right? Still a far cry from the four megabytes per second that we were promised. So I'm still not gonna be really happy. Um, if we read the next sector, no delays. We can just have transfer time. Now we actually see the four megabytes per second that we were promised. Right? So the takeaway here is if we want to use our disk efficiently and think file system, we want to minimize the amount of seeking and rotational delays that we incur. Right? So as much sequential reads of the next sector on the same track or cylinder as we can do is going to be really important. That's going to give us the highest performance. Okay, so that kind of naturally leads into the question of how we actually uh, schedule uh, our disk. So just as we had CPU scheduling, now we're gonna look at a different scheduling problem. So the disk can only do one thing at a time, and uh, we have to move the arm in order to get to the location that we want to read from and wait for the disk to rotate. So I'm gonna ignore cylinders for now uh, and just assume we have a, a single arm and uh, we're, we're moving it from one track to another. So we have a bunch of requests that come in from users. So like track two, sector two, track five, sector two, track seven, sector two, and so on. Right. We have to figure out what order we're gonna service those requests in. Now, there's lots of scheduling algorithms and we're gonna go through uh, four of them and, and look at uh, the trade-offs between them. And the four are first in, first out. That's our favorite, our, our simplest of all. Shortest seek time first. And then two uh, scan algorithms, scan and uh, C-scan. Okay, now, um, to further simplify the problem, we're gonna ignore the sector number and just look at the track number. Right, so we're gonna start with our disk head on a particular track and we're just gonna move it around 
uh, and following a, a given scheduling algorithm. All right. Let's start with FIFO. So let's say we have uh, our head sitting here on track five, and our request queue is two, one, three, six, two, and five. Those are the track numbers. So what's going to be our scheduling order? Yeah, it's really easy. This is two, one, three, six, two, five. Okay. So we're on five. Um, we will move the head in to service two. We'll move it in again to service one. Then we'll move it back out to service uh, track three. Then we'll move it out to six to service uh, request six. Move it back in to service request two. Move it back out to service request five. All right. So advantages, really uh, simple to implement. And it's fair amongst the requesters, right? Whatever order you arrived in is the order your request gets serviced in. But depending on the order of, of arrival, we may be doing a lot of long seeks. And I just got through telling you, right, the last thing we want to do is lots of seeks because that's going to really hurt our performance. Right? We're going to get the lowest speed out of the drive instead of the fastest speed. Okay, so let's look at shortest seek time first. So instead of, of trying to just take it in the order, we're going to, to do a sort. So if we assume the head's again starting at uh, track five, um, now this is called shortest seek time first. It also has to take into account the rotational delay. Uh, but for today, we're just going to look at the, the seek time as, as our metric. So if our request queue is two, one, three, six, two, five, and we start on five, where are we going to go first? Five, right? Seek, seek distance is zero. And then we'll go six, and then we'll go three, then two, and two, and one, okay? So that'll look like this. We'll, we'll service the request that's on track five, then we'll seek to track six, we'll seek to track three, seek to track two, service the second request on track two, and finally seek to track one. So the advantage, we've reduced the number of seeks. Right, we're seeking, uh, not, I'm sorry, not the number of seeks, the distance we're seeking. So a lot shorter distance seeks. The disadvantage is it could lead to starvation. Right? If we have lots of requests that are out here, we may never service requests that are at the inside of the disk. All right? So this would not be a good algorithm to implement in practice. So an alternative is scan. So with scan, we're going to take the closest request in the direction of travel. So we're going to assume the head is moving towards the center of the disk. And our request queue is two, one, three, six, two, five. All right. So what's going to be our order? We'll first take five, because right, we're already on that track, so we don't have to move. Then we'll take three. Then we'll take two, the other two, one, and then we'll seek out to six. So we'll go three, uh, five rather, three, two, two, one, out to six. Yes. Yes, because there are two references to two, so we look at two twice. Yeah, so the question is what happens if another request for two and another request for two and another request for two comes in? Yes, that could cause us to starve the other request. Yeah, if we're continually sorting our, our queue by the closest thing. So advantage here is we're not going to starve areas as long as we have a distribution of requests. Right? If we have a hot spot, we're going to stay on that track until we, we uh, service the request on that, uh, that track. Um, and we've reduced the amount of seek distance that we have. Right? But the disadvantage is it's not very fair. Right? We're favoring the tracks in the middle. This is why if you ever live in like a high-rise building, pick a middle floor. Because right? then there's always elevators going up or elevators going down. And so you're, you have a high probability of catching an elevator in a very short amount of time. If you're at the extremes, it takes a lot longer. That's why we put the labs in Soda Hall in the basement. Right? It takes a lot longer for you guys to get elevators. But faculty offices used to be on the, the fifth and sixth floors, so we had elevators always going by us. Okay, so a fairer approach is C-Scan. So with C-Scan, we're only going to service the requests in one direction. So, for example, we might only service the request going from the outside to the in. Coming back, we won't service uh, requests. I'm, I'm sorry, the other way around, from the center to the outside. 
So if our request queue is 213625, our order will then be service the request on track five, continue moving out to track six, then seek all the way back to track one, then service two, then service two, then service three. Okay? So we'll do this. Five, then we seek out to six, we seek all the way back in, then we service the request on, tr on track one, service the request on track two, the second request on track two, service the request on track three. All right? Yes? Sure, uh, that's a very good question, and that's actually the original way hard drives worked. So the original hard drives were actually a, a drum, and you, it, had, it was coated with magnetic media, and you had a head on every track. But the heads were actually in physical contact with the drum. So that limited the size and the density of uh, tracks that you could have. And, uh, and the heads were direct contact with the drum, which meant they were wearing the media off over time. So with Bernoulli drives, you're, the head is floating uh, with uh, Winchester drives, rather, using the Bernoulli principle, the head floats above the drive. It's less than the width of a human hair that it, it floats above the drive. So um, if we put multiple heads, uh, first of all, we wouldn't be able to put them close enough to match the densities of tracks. And the second is the airflow would interfere with each other and we'd have heads crashing all the time. And the third would be, if you wanted to make it move, it would be really heavy and that would require really big motors. Yeah, so, I mean, people have looked at a, a variety of different techniques. Uh, you know, if you really want to read something that, like, drives that are really amazing, look up uh, shingled magnetic recording. With that technology, rather than having discrete tracks, the tracks actually overlap, and they use complex signal processing to actually recover your data, hopefully. Um, Seagate, I think, is going to be releasing those drives uh, next year, and they're going to store, like, five terabytes in, in one of these small form factor drives. Yeah. Ah, so the question is why uh, short seek time first will lead to uh, starvation. Um, that's because it's going to always take the request that's closest. Uh, let's see if we can find, yeah, there we go. It's gonna take the request that's, that's closest. So if there are a lot of requests, say to, to track uh, six, it's gonna continue to service the, or, or five and six, it's gonna just ping pong back and forth servicing those requests. And it won't ever go in and service the requests that are inside. Okay, so with C-Scan, um, again, we're only going in, in one direction. So we have the advantage that it's fairer than scan. Uh, but the disadvantage of, we have these long seeks where we don't do anything. So it seems like kind of wasted work. But this is a trade-off to get better fairness. Okay, any other, yeah, sure, any other question? Yes, uh, C-scan and scan are, are better in terms of, of starvation. Yeah. So again, here, we're, we're not going to just simply go back and forth. So if we got a request, if we're on track five, uh, and then we go to six, and then we get another request for track five, even though it's very close, we're not gonna service it. We're gonna go all the way in and then work our way back out. That's correct. If there was a string of requests for a, a single track where we're not seeking, we would service those requests. Right, but we're not gonna starve for, for seeks back and forth you know, between five and six or four, five, and six and ignore, uh, say, track one. Yeah, so you can sort of, uh, drives, uh, the question is, uh, could we still have starvation or are there more sophisticated things? Drives today are incredibly sophisticated. So they have um, a variety of scheduling algorithms. They can do more things like, for example, look at how long something sat in the queue. And if it sat in the queue too long, then, then bump it to the front of the queue and service it anyway. So you don't have starvation. Yeah. Uh, they're implemented in, the question is, are these algorithms implemented in software? They're implemented in the firmware of the drive. So yes, they are software. So the drives have a microcontroller or a microprocessor that's running all of these algorithms. Again, you know, older drives were really dumb. And the, 
All of these algorithms and scheduling of the drive was implemented in the device driver in software by the main processor. Now all of this is implemented uh, primarily by the actual device. Okay, any other questions about hard drives? Yeah. Sure, absolutely. Uh, the question is, is there any optimization of where we place data? So, you know, one of the optimizations that, so originally when people were storing the, the sort of, uh, we'll, we'll get to it, I'm you know, skipping way ahead, but the uh, inode structures, which are the, the metadata for where we find files and things like that, that was originally stored on the outer track of the drive. But the head is never near the outer track of the drive. So quickly it was realized, was much better to store it in the middle tracks because that's where the head is spending a lot of time. And so we're gonna have much shorter seek times to go and read the, uh, the metadata that tells us uh, where to find our files and directories. So absolutely. Um, you know, it's, it's really, you know, we're gonna see a lot in file systems that were shaped by these physical constraints that we have with a, a hard drive. Any other questions? So now let's, switch gears and talk about what I would really consider a, a very revolutionary change in uh, how we store our information. And that is the rise of the solid state uh, drive. So it turns out solid state drives themselves are not new. Uh, they've been around since uh, the mid 90s. Uh, back in the mid 90s, it was basically take a, a card, put a bunch of DRAM on it and put a battery on it. That was a solid state drive. Um, it worked. It was very expensive, but it was very fast. Uh, you know, if you had any, if the battery ran down, um, you lost all your data. So it, it uh, primarily had applications in, in uh, very high-end servers and uh, also military applications. In 2009, that's when the real change happened. That was really the introduction of uh, NAND-based multi-level cell flash memory. So in multi-level cell flash memory, you have these cells and each cell you fill full of electrons, the floating uh, transistor gate. And depending on how many electrons you put in it, you can measure four levels uh, of charge, and that four levels of charge translates into two bits per cell. And uh, you, you, have, uh, you store data in your, your sector size here is four kilobyte pages, but you store multiples of those pages, anywhere from four to 64 of those pages in a memory block. And I'll go through what that means in, in a lot more detail in, in just a moment. No moving parts. This is what makes it so revolutionary. They're really small. So, you know, I, I, I asked one of my colleagues uh, who just had a, a SSD fail on him, uh, could I bring it in, you know, take it apart and show it to the class? And he's like, no, my data's on there. And I'm like, yeah, but it's all corrupted, so it doesn't matter anyway. But still didn't want to part with it. Um, but it really doesn't matter because what does it look like? Well, on the outside, it looks just like a hard drive. And if you open it up, it just looks like a computer. Right? It's just a bunch of identical memory chips. And they're, they're really thin. The amazing thing, if you open up one of these, uh, is it's mostly air because it's designed to match the form factor of a standard laptop drive or standard enterprise drive. Uh, but inside, it's, it's just a bunch of, of chips. And depending on, on the capacity, it may even only be chips on one side of the board. Uh, the higher capacity drives will have multiple boards or, or multiple chips on each side of the board. But no moving parts, no motors. So it's silent, it's very low power, it's incredibly shock resistant, and we've eliminated those physical constraints. So there's no seek delay, there's no rotational delay, which means our access times are on the order of tenths of a millisecond. So really fast access times. So how do we read from one of these things? So if we look at it from an architecture standpoint, what we find inside is that there's uh, some software uh, that manages a, a queue of incoming requests and also a little bit of DRAM. Uh, now, high-end drives will actually have a supercapacitor or s really small battery in them so that if they lose power, uh, the DRAM remains powered. Consumer drives and most other enterprise drives do not, which means you can actually suffer data corruption if you turn off power uh, to an SSD. 
um, if it has any state that's currently being stored in the DRAM. There's a flash memory controller which actually talks to the banks of, of flash chips. And you actually have parallel access to them so that you can actually do multiple things at the same time uh, internally with, uh, with a flash uh, drive. Reading data is very fast, 25 microseconds. So incredibly fast, no seek, no rotational delay. The transfer time is basically how long does it take me to transfer a four kilobyte page. And that's gonna be mainly limited by uh, the, how powerful this controller is and uh, the disk interface. So if you connect it via SATA, you're gonna be limited to somewhere between 300 and 600 uh, megabits per sec megabytes per second. All right. uh, so latency then is just queuing time in the operating system plus the controller time, the queues here, uh, plus the transfer time. So very, very low. So the amazing thing here is now you get the highest bandwidth if you read sequentially or you read random because there's no moving parts. Everything's equally far apart. And also everything's equally close. So this kind of really changes everything when we start to think, you know, when we look at file systems, there are a lot of decisions that file systems made based on drives being physical. Uh, you know, physically things that have to move. Okay. That's the easy part. Everything comes at a price. Writes are way more complicated and way more expensive. So writes can take anywhere from 200, millis 200 microseconds up to 1.7 milliseconds, right? That's versus uh, 25 microsecond for a read. So an order of magnitude to a couple order of magnitude. The problem we have with flash is you can only write a blank page. Page has to be empty. So we write data in four kilobyte chunks. When a page is full or uh, full of things that we're not, we don't want to use, we erase it. Erasing is really expensive. Erasing takes one and a half milliseconds. So what's gonna happen is the controller is behind the scenes gonna constantly be trying to maintain a pool of empty pages on, on blocks so that you can write at this 200 microsecond speed. But depending on the drive, if it's a uh, consumer drive, the controller is less powerful and has a less, lot less flexibility and freedom to find free page, uh, free blocks and free pages. And so it's gonna perform a lot slower than an enterprise drive, which is, uh, as I'll talk about in a little moment, uh, a little while, is going to cheat. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is why does this take so long? So uh, erasing is really expensive because you have to apply a high voltage to each one of the cells to basically reset the cell. Um, and so that makes it expensive. Right, similarly, you have to apply a high voltage to get those electrons to stick in the cell because um, you have to basically get, force them through an insulator and, uh, and that takes a lot of, of current. And so charging up the, the, uh, the rails to do that is time consuming. And, uh, and that's where your biggest delay comes from. Yeah. Ah, good question. So what about this is different? So in a DRAM, you're storing it in a, uh, a leaky uh, cell, basically. So you have to constantly, it's called dynamic RAM because you periodically have to refresh the RAM and recharge those cells. If you remove power, all the charge leaks away. In a uh, non-volatile, uh, in a flash cell, a NAND cell, there's an insulator. And so you have to force electrons into that well. And then once they're in the well, they're trapped. So getting them back out, again, you have to apply a high charge to force them out of the, the, the cell. So that's the big difference between DRAM and uh, non-volatile RAM. Because it's insulated, it's like you know, pouring, it, you know, pouring liquid nitrogen into a doer. It'll keep it nice and cold, you know, unlike if you put it in a cup where it'll just boil away. Yeah. I'm sorry, what's the question? Yes. So the question is, is this what people call flash memory? Yes. So uh, NAND flash doesn't just appear in drives. It also appears in USB sticks, SD cards. All of those rely on, on NAND flash technologies, multi-level cell technologies. 
Uh, the question is, is it true that this becomes unusable after about 10 years? Yeah, so there was a study at CMU that found the average uh, expected lifetime of a drive was around seven to nine years, which is actually higher than a uh, spinning drive, which is typically rated for a lifetime of around five to six years. The difference is, as we'll see in a moment, these drives are much more prone to like a catastrophic failure where they just suddenly corrupt all your data. So they're really fast, but you know, live dangerously, yeah. Ah, so the question is how we, how we deal with clearing pages and writing. I'm gonna go through an example of that in, uh, I think it's my next slide, uh, I'm gonna talk about how you actually manage the, the controller manages free space on pages. You do use the DRAM. You use the DRAM as a temporary holding space. That's why there is this risk of if you turn off the power, you could turn it off while you're in the middle of, of uh, an operation and lose the data that you thought was non-volatile on the drive. I'll, I'll, I think it'll become much clearer when I, when I go through the example. Was there another question? Yeah. Ah, so the question is, do SSDs always require a battery uh, to, to, remain, to retain data? No, so, the, so the, the thing is there is this small DRAM which is used and we'll see how it's used for housekeeping. Aside from that, everything is non-volatile. So the only risk is if your drive is doing this housekeeping and you turn off the power, you, you know, hold down the power button on your, your computer or pull the plug or pull the battery, there is the risk of, of low level corruption. But only for that narrow window. Um, but it turns out there was a research paper recently that, that found that actually was a, a significant likelihood if you pulled power from an SSD that, that you could have some low level data corruption. So always shut down your operating system. Don't pull the plug. Okay, so how does this work? So here we have a block that has a bunch of free pages on it and we write A, B, C, D. Okay. Now um, we're going to do eight more writes. We're going to write E, F, G, H, and we're going to write new versions of blocks uh, of uh, pages A, B, C, D. Okay, because we updated them. We recompiled your project, right? So we rewrite that data. All right. Now we can't actually get rid of these, so we're just going to record in our bookkeeping tables that these are the correct values for A, B, and C, and D, right? and these are obsolete. We don't need these anymore. And then periodically what's going to happen is the controller is going to go and create more free space. So now we have no free pages. So what it'll do is it'll find another block that, and it'll erase that block and then it'll copy all the data from that old block to the new block. Now we have four free pages. This is called coalescing or garbage collection. When you're doing this coalescing or garbage collection, it is one of the most complicated algorithms that the drive has. And as a result, they often get it wrong. People are human. And this uh, solid state drives is an incredibly competitive marketplace. Everybody's trying to provide the fastest drive with the highest capacity, with uh, the best uh, wear leveling algorithms, as, as we'll talk about in a moment. And so as a result, bugs creep into the firmware. So I had one of these drives, I think it was probably about three or four years ago, uh, that was in a Windows uh, laptop. And over the course of six months, it managed to corrupt a significant fraction of my, my data. And it was all sort of silent corruption. All of a sudden, my operating system didn't boot. And when I did boot it, you know, I could see files had been corrupted. I make backups. I make backups on a nightly basis, so I didn't actually lose any data in the process. So it's a public safety announcement for making backups. My colleague, who had his drive fail two weeks ago, exact same thing, different manufacturer, silently corrupted the data and rendered his system uh, non-bootable. Uh, he went to his backups and his backups were corrupted. So he lost like six months worth of, uh, of work. Uh, the biggest problem actually was the reconstructing, you know, finding all the license keys and, and files and, and disks and things like that so he could reinstall uh, his software. So that's a public safety announcement for you should not only make backups, but you should periodically actually test to see that your backups work. Don't say I didn't warn you. Now, when a drive is typically full, which drives are always full, 
because that's just the nature of the beast. You know, we are uh, really bad uh, about deleting things. You end up with around one erase every 64 to 128 writes. Um, in enterprise drives, they will reserve more blocks than the drive actually has. In fact, it can be as many as 80% of the capacity of the drive is reserved and unavailable to you. That way they can always have three blocks and you can write to them at, uh, at full speed. Um, in consumer drives, they typically only reserve maybe 5 to 10% of the capacity of uh, the, DRAM, of the um, NAN chips for, uh, for doing stuff like this and also replacing pages that wear out. Yeah. What's my opinion on cloud backup? I think it's a great idea. I think you should use more than one cloud provider. Cloud providers do occasionally go out of business. And you don't want them to go out of business and take your backups with them. Um, but I, so I back up locally on a NAS drive at home, and then I also mirror that to, uh, to a disk in the office. So I back up to multiple places. And then I keep a lot of stuff in the cloud also, yeah. Ah, so how do you test your backups? Uh, have they been corrupted? Uh, you can periodically test your, pro your process by trying to recover a file and seeing whether or not you can recover it. Um, that often diagnoses a lot of problems. Um, if you really care, you can actually you know, sit there and run a diff that will compare the contents of your disk with the contents of your, your backup. So one of the other things I also do like for, for my MacBook is I, I clone it periodically. I clone the, it to an external drive. That's just to speed up the recovery process. So I can recover quickly to a cloned image and then you know, play forward on the, the incrementals. OK. Um, so one of the challenges with NAND is that it's destructive doing these reads and write, uh, these uh, writes and, and erases because it requires high voltage to uh, change the, the cells. So we end up damaging the, me the memory cells every time we erase uh, a page, so uh, erase a, a block rather. So um, the drives are constantly trying to balance and level where the writes are going and where the erases are going. So what this means as a side effect is that you write some data and it gets written to a location. And then the drive is constantly doing garbage collection and this where leveling. And so your data actually moves through multiple chips on uh, the drive. This is called write amplification. And this is why it's really important that those coalescing algorithms be correct. Because every time you move the data, there is a probability, if the, if the algorithm has an error, of introducing corruption. So um, no really good solutions except to buy from reputable manufacturers, which I thought I was doing. Um, and make sure you're on the latest version of the firmware. But don't go on the latest version of the firmware until after it's been out there for a while. Um, and bugs have been found in it. Uh, the other thing is the controller will use error correcting codes to be able to correct when errors do occur and uh, a memory cell has become degraded. Uh, you'll correct the error and then you'll mark the uh, block as being unusable and use one of your spare blocks. Yeah. Sure. Right, so the question is why can't we sort of do a replace in, in place? And the problem is you have to erase. There is no rewrite. Once you've written a, a page, you cannot change this page without erasing the entire block and then rewriting it. Yeah. If you have a free page, you can write that. But if you don't have a free page, you have to erase an entire block and then write the pages. So this is why your drive does a lot, a lot of copying. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, uh, for erasing the block, effectively that's what you are doing. You're removing all the charge, you're writing zeros to all of the pages on this block. Um, no, you, in order, because you need to remove, if you have a one, 
you need to remove that one from a cell. And removing that requires high voltage. So to re reset all the cells to empty requires high voltage erase. So the question is, when we're erasing, are we erasing everything on a chip or just a page? You're just erasing a page. The page is our unit of allocation which, within the uh, SSD. So we, we write individual blocks and we erase entire pages at a time. So again, the question is, why don't we have to do this with, with main memory? Because with main memory, it's volatile. We can easily remove or add charge because, we, again, the way that a, a NAND cell works is it's this, literally this cell that we have an insulator on top of and a floating junction transistor on top of that. So we have to force, a, we have to use high voltage to get charge to go into that cell because it's fully insulated, right? So this way, when we take power away, those electrons, and it may be a very small number of electrons, like tens of electrons that are sitting in that cell, will stay there and not be able to leak out. Yeah, D well, DRAM is similar except that DRAM, the cell, it does not have an insulator. So if we remove power, the charge all just floats away. Uh, we, can, we can drain the charge out of a DRAM cell. Okay, so the result of all of this complexity is that writes are very workload dependent because it's the queuing time in the operating system plus the time for the controller to find a free uh, block that we can write to, um, or actually this should be a free page, and, uh, and the transfer time. The highest bandwidth we're gonna get is gonna be either with sequential or random writes. In both cases, it's limited by the number of empty pages. So if the controller is doing a good job in the background of creating empty pages, we're fine. And the highest end controllers will do that as fast as we can write uh, so as, as fast as the uh, bus into the, the drive. The rule of thumb, though, is that writes are 10 times more expensive than reads, and uh, erases are 10 times more expensive than writes. So in terms of the sort of price performance trade-offs, capacity trade-offs, a uh, hard drive is 50 to 100 megabytes for uh, sequential read-write. Uh, the cost is uh, around uh, 5 cents uh, per gigabyte to a, a, a dime per gigabyte. Um, Size, two to four terabytes, ever growing bigger. Uh, SSDs, it varies. So on the consumer and low-end enterprise side, you're looking at 200 to 50, 550 megabytes per second uh, for reads and, and writes. Uh, co cost is a lot higher, a dollar to a dollar 50 a gigabyte. Capacities, 200 to a terabyte, 200 gigabytes to a terabyte. For enterprise, high-end enterprise drives, you can actually read at six gigabytes per second Instead of attaching the drive to the SATA bus, they'll attach it to the PCI bus, which lets you do six gigabyte per second transfers. Writes, the highest end drives, and these are really expensive, so add a lot of zeros here, are 4.4 uh, gigabytes per second. So they can write almost as fast as they can read. But again, you're getting a really small drive. The vast majority of the drive's physical capacity is being reserved by the controller so that it can produce free pages as fast as you're writing at this 4.4 gigabyte per second uh, rate. And then memory uh, is typically 10 to 16 gigabyte per second, uh, depending on the bus. Uh, a little bit more expensive at five to 10 gigabytes, uh, dollars per gigabyte, and capacity is anywhere from 64 to, to uh, 256 is, is probably top capacity for uh, servers. So takeaway, SSDs give you 10 times the bandwidth of a hard drive, uh, for, for consumer side, and uh, DRAM is 10 times faster than SSDs, again, on the consumer side. Price, hard drives are 20th the cost of, of SSDs. SSDs are uh, one-fifth the cost of DRAM. That said, the cheapest way you can make an old computer run faster, put more memory in it, and replace the hard drive with uh, an SSD. So how many people have a, an SSD? So it's amazing. Every semester, this fraction grows. I would bet, you know, five years from now, it will be 100%, probably even sooner uh, than that, just because the costs of uh, SSDs are, are plummeting on, a, on an exponential curve. It's all about volume. The more volume that's produced, the lower cost it, it's going to be. 
Okay. Wow, we're running way behind. Um, so advantages uh, for SSDs relative to hard drives. Low latency, high throughput, eliminate all the physical delays of, of seek and, and rotation, no moving parts, lightweight, low power, silent, shock uh, and sensitive. We can read at memory speeds based on the, the controller and the bus. Downside, they're a lot smaller and they're much more expensive. An interesting thing is a hybrid where you combine a small SSD with a really large hard drive. So think like a 64 gigabyte uh, SSD or 128 gigabyte SSD paired up with a terabyte hard drive. So if you manage the storage correctly in the file system, you can store the frequently accessed things in the SSDs and store all the rest of your photos and everything in the hard drive. So you get the capacity of a hard drive with the speed of an SSD. Is there a question in the back? Exactly. It is basically a cache. You turn the SSD into a, another tier of storage uh, in our memory hierarchy. Uh, Macs do this. Mac minis you can buy with the, I think they call it the fusion drive. Um, uh, Windows will do it with, um, uh, they call it ready boost. And then I think uh, Seagate sells some drives that, that do that. Uh, the other con here is the asymmetric performance when we're doing writes. Because we have to do this, this read, uh, erase, and write uh, operation in order to um, uh, find uh, free pages. Also, because we're doing destructive writes and destructive erases, there's a limited drive uh, lifespan. Um, the average failure rate is around six years, and uh, the life expectancy is nine to, to 11 uh, years. That's based on a, a CMU study of um, SSDs. The downside, however, is they tend to fail more spectacularly, right, because of these bugs in the uh, controller algorithms, whereas hard drives, are very well understood, uh, and so the, the failure rates for hard drives is also very well uh, understood. Okay, so some administrative stuff. Um, we have a design doc that's due uh, tomorrow uh, at midnight, and uh, next Monday we have a midterm. And just a reminder, don't want everybody to show up here. If your last name is A through L, you'll be in this room. If your last name is M through Z, you'll be in 2060 Valley Life Sciences uh, building. It'll cover everything in the course up until today. So that's lectures 1 to 13. That's all the readings, the handouts, uh, and projects 1 and 2, since your uh, design doc for project 2 is due tomorrow. The TAs are awesome. They're going to do a review session on Friday from 5 to 7 p.m. in 390 uh, Hearst Mining Building. Come with questions. So they're going to spend a, a small portion of time reviewing the material in the, in the class. The rest of the time is going to be open for you guys to ask questions. There's over a decade worth of midterms on uh, the course homepage. I encourage you to read through those exams. You'll see that there's a lot of commonalities and a lot of uh, problems uh, that of various forms or other tend to recur on the exams. So make sure you especially study those uh, problems and come with questions to the uh, review session. Finally, as uh, Professor Candy pointed out on Monday, we have a survey monkey up. This is your opportunity to be heard. Your voice matters. We care about your experience in this class. If you're not having a great experience in this class and you have some constructive criticisms for us, please provide that feedback. We'll try to make changes to uh, improve the class. If you're having a great experience in the class, also let us know. We like knowing if we're, we're doing things right or we're doing things uh, incorrectly. Uh, we get feedback from Eta Kappa Nu, but that doesn't happen until like the middle of the next semester. So it's hard for us to make changes uh, based upon that. Any questions? All right, so um, I was gonna do a quiz, I'm not gonna do a quiz. Um, I was going to take a break, but we're running really far behind, so I'm going to skip the break. Um, hopefully, you're, you're, I'm still keeping you awake. Okay, so let's talk about building a file system. So a file system is the layer in the operating system that takes us from this block interface that the drives provide us with and turns it into files and directories. So there's a whole bunch of things that a file system has to do. Not all file systems do everything, but every file system does disk management, turns a set of blocks into files.
Every file system deals with naming. Provides an interface, a human readable interface to translate human readable names into files and directories. Uh, they provide layers to keep your data secure. They provide layers uh, for reliability and durability. So making sure your files are still there even if you have a disk crash or media failure or some malicious attack or something like that. Not all file systems provide a high level of reliability and durability. Some do, not all do. Now, we can look at a file uh, from many different levels. We can start by looking at it from the point of view of a user. From the point of view of a user, we have durable data structures. I have a grades file. You have your project code. Right? Those are data structures that have semantic meaning to us. From the point of view of an operating system, it's just a collection of bytes. That the system call interface, it knows nothing about the semantics of what you're trying to store. Could be a movie, could be pictures, could be HTML files. From the point of view of a file system, uh, from the operating system, it's just a, a collection of bytes. If we look inside the operating system, a file is actually just a collection of blocks. A block is this logical unit of transfer to and from the drive. And a block is larger than a sector size or equal to a sector size. So in Unix, a typical block size is 4 kilobytes. It's getting bigger now, and now you'll see things like 16 kilobyte uh, block sizes. So we need to go from the user's view down to what we actually store on the disk. And so from a user point, if a user says something like, give me the bytes that are stored at location 2 through 12 in my file, what does the operating system do? Well, it's just going to retrieve the block that contains bytes 2 through 12 and then return just bytes through 2 through 12. What if we say write bytes 2 through 12? Well, now it's going to do a read, modify, write cycle. It's going to fetch the block containing bytes 2 through 12. It's going to modify the portion of the block. And then it's going to write that block back out. Yes? Um, in this case, we're, we'll assume 4 kilobytes. Yes. And uh, it is an expensive operation. You know, we're just writing 10 bytes and we've got to read, you know, an entire block of 4 kilobytes. And especially as blocks get bigger, um, like 16 kilobyte uh, blocks, yes, we're wasting, you know, some of our bandwidth uh, to do this. But, you know, when you have a terabyte size drive or multi-terabyte size drive, 4 kilobyte or even 1 kilobyte or the original 512 byte uh, blocks, that doesn't work very well. We need a lot of data structures to keep track of that. Yes. Yes. R write it to the disk. Ah, so for now, we're going to assume there's no cache. Um, in reality, there is a buffer cache, and we would write the block into the buffer cache, and then eventually the, um, the file system would write out the block to the actual hard drive. Okay. So... Everything in a file system is in these whole size blocks. So it doesn't matter whether we write an individual byte or we read an individual byte. So if we're doing get C and put C, those are going to do buffering. So if we're doing put C, we're going to buffer until we get to 4 kilobytes and then write out 4 kilobytes. If we're doing get C, we'll read an entire 4 kilobyte chunk and then return it to the user program uh, a byte at a time. So from now on, everything we're going to think about here is going to be as a collection of blocks. We're going to ignore the sort of byte interface that gets built on top of it by uh, the, the rest of the file system and the operating system. We're just going to think about a chunk, of, uh, a set of blocks, a collection of blocks. So, next question is how we manage those blocks. And we're going to break them up into two sets. One is files. These are user visible groups of blocks that are arranged sequentially in a logical space. So just as like with an address space, we had the notion from a user standpoint that we had memory from 0 to 2 to the n. The same thing is true here. A file starts at 0 and goes to n, where n is the size of the file. And then that's turned into a set of blocks scattered out on the disk. Even though from us, from our standpoint, it's a sequential set of blocks. The directory is just the user visible mapping where we map from names to files. All right. Now, we access the disk as a linear array of these sectors 
Uh, modern drives use what's called logical block uh, addressing. And uh, every sector has an integer address from zero up to the maximum number of sectors. The controller deals with everything else. So the controller deals with the actual physical layout of those sectors on tracks and heads and, and, and so on. And it deals with any bad blocks. So there will be defects in the media. At the factory, they analyze the, the drive and see where the defects are and then store that in a, a firmware chip on the drive. And then the drive keeps track of all of its bad blocks and remaps so you don't see any bad blocks. That all happens under the covers. And then the controller also is responsible for figuring out where a given uh, sector is stored on the disk. And so it's hidden from the operating system. Again, older drives, older operating systems had to worry about everything. They had to know the physical layout of the disk. Modern drives, you don't know anything about the layout of the disk. Question? Ah, very good question. So if the har hardware is, uh, and the drive is hiding these bad sectors, how much of your drive can go bad before something happens? So there's a set of reserved sectors uh, on the drive. Same thing with an SSD. We have reserved blocks on the SSD. And as blocks go bad in an SSD or as sectors go bad in a drive, it transparently remaps uh, those behind the scenes. Now, you can actually find out exactly how many of these reallocations have occurred if you run the smart con uh, command or uh, smart tool against your drive. How many people know what a smart tool is? Ooh, only one. So the rest of you have no idea. Your drives could be just about to fail. Um, on a Mac, you can go to the uh, about system information, and if you look at your drive, it'll say smart tests pass. If it says smart tests failed, time to get a new drive. Um, under Windows, you can download smart tools, um, either from the drive manufacturer or there are a bunch of uh, freeware ones, and actually see all of the statistics for your drive. How many reallocations have been done? How many times the drive has been turned on and off? How many times there's been an error that's been correctable? How many times there's been an uncorrectable error? And uh, if you look at those statistics and they start growing, it's time to replace your drive. The error statistics, not the power cycle statistics. Yeah. Oh, you're skipping ahead. So the question is, if the hardware is abstracting the drive and lying about all this stuff and it just looks like a linear array, how can we build file systems that take advantage of the structure of the drive? The answer is, it's becoming really hard. You, because the drive is not being honest about where it's storing data, it, you think you're storing stuff sequentially and it may actually be stored, uh, if a block was replaced, it could actually be stored somewhere else. So this is actually a great complication. Now, the good news is, as we shift to SSDs, all that goes away. Okay, so um, we need a way to, to, to track what blocks are free on the drive. And uh, originally that was done using a free list, uh, a linked list. That's in inefficient for a four terabyte drive. So we use a, a bitmap instead. Um, we need to know where all the blocks of a file are located. That's stored in a file header. So each file has a file header, and that tells you where to find the blocks for that file. And so we're going to optimize the placement of a file's disk blocks to try and match the access and the usage patterns for those files. So this should really raise the question, what are the access patterns for a file system, and what are the usage patterns? So let's start with access patterns. So there are three different access patterns, two of which are very common. The first is sequential. So this means I read a bunch of bytes, and then I read the next n bytes, and then I read the next n bytes, and then I read the next n bytes. Most accesses are of this form. Random is give me some bytes a, i through j. This is important, even though it's less frequent, because we use it for things like paging. Right? The swap file on disk we don't want to have to read the whole swap file just to read a page so we can uh, restore it to memory, to implement virtual memory with paging. 
So it's not a very frequent case, but it has to be very fast because when we do use it, we need it to be very, very fast. And then finally could be content-based access. So you could say, you know, uh, for a, a, an HR database, a, a human, um, uh, uh, an employee records database, um, find the 100 bytes starting with Joseph and then take the salary field and double it. Um, don't think that's happening anytime soon. Most systems don't provide this form of access. Instead, what they do is they build a database, which requires random access, on top of uh, files that are organized sequentially, like a set of records. Um, an example would be something like, you know, Spotlight Search on the Mac. Uh, it allows you to, you know, search by content rather than having to think of the name of the file. Okay, so usage patterns. Turns out most files on your computer are small, right? There are your .java files, your .c files, and, and so on. There are a few files that are really big, like executables and, and core files and swap files, but most of the files are really small. On the other hand, those large files can take up most of the disk space. It only takes a few Blu-ray movies to fill up your hard drive. I don't know that from experience. Um, and, you know, that seems kind of contradictory, but they're equivalent to a huge number of small files. Right? A 10 gig movie file equals a lot of Java files. It's also the case that they use most of the bandwidth going to and from the disk because they're massive, right? Now, we're going to use these observations, but it's very important to be aware that uh, you can look at usage patterns and beat your competitors by optimizing for the frequent patterns, but patterns change over time, right? And also, people may be using systems because of the way they perform, right? Maybe people have lots of small files in Unix because big files are really inefficient and slow. So they break up their big files into small files. So you, anytime you try to look at a usage pattern and optimize around it, you want to be careful that you're not sort of uh, falling down a rat hole and optimizing for what you see today and you get passed by by what happens to, tomorrow, right? When Unix file systems were designed, most people weren't storing terabyte size, uh, multi-hundred gigabyte size files. Today, that's very common. Okay, so our goals for our file system, maximize sequential performance, provide efficient random access, and make it easy to grow and shrink files. So in the last few minutes, I want to talk about the most common file system in the world, which is the file allocation table. Originally developed by Microsoft for floppy drives, it's in everything. If you have an Android phone, it supports the FAT file system because that's what the SD card uses to store data. If you have a digital camera, it uses the FAT file system on the SD card or the compact flash card. So it's in like well over, I think it, the last count it was like a, several billion devices that use the FAT file system. That said, it's insanely simple. Okay, so how does it work? It has a directory entry, and it links together the blocks of a file. But rather than doing it with the links being in the blocks, the links are in a file allocation table. So this file allocation table has one entry for every block that you have on the media, whether it's an SD card, a hard drive, a floppy drive, or uh, something else. So these entries are linked together. And so if I want to find, uh, if I want to read the contents of this file, I first go to block 217. So this is our file header. And uh, that tells me that uh, read block 217. Then the next block of the file is going to be 618. So I read block 618. Then the next block is going to be 339. So I can read 339. And that's the last block of the file. Right? So sequential access is going to be very expensive if you don't cache the fat in memory. Right? Because you're going to read block 618 then have to seek all the way back to the file allocation table, read it into memory, look to see what the next thing is, which is uh, uh, 339, three, then seek all the way back over, read 339, then seek all the way back to the file allocation table to read the next, and so on. So you want to cache it in memory. Random access is always going to be slow, um, but it's going to be really expensive if the file allocation table is not stored in memory. Now one problem that this has is these blocks are not 
sequential. So we're going to be doing lots of seeks for reads or for writes, which is not very good. Uh, and so for floppy drives and for hard drives that use the FAT file system, they're not going to perform very well. If we put it on an SD card, it'll perform very well because everything is equidistant on an SD card because it's, it's uh, NAND flash. Okay, I'm going to skip the next quiz and uh, go to the summary. All right, so what do we look at today? We looked at magnetic hard drive performance. The performance here is a function of the queuing time plus the controller time plus seek and rotational transfer uh, cost. Rotational latency is on average half of a rotation to go around. And the transfer time depends on the rotation speed and the bit density. We spent a lot of time talking about solid state drives. The read performance is a function of queuing time, controller time, and the transfer rate. The write time is a function of queuing time plus the time for us to find a free uh, page that we can write to, which may require erasing and copying and doing lots of coalescing, plus the transfer time. The amount of time to find a free block is going to depend on how full the SSD is and also the duration of our writes. So if we're really pounding our drive with lots of writes, it's going to suddenly slow down on us because it's going to be doing lots of coalescing. And then also the drives have a limited lifespan, but it's pretty long. Nine to 11 years is longer than most people keep a computer. Uh, the downside is they can fail catastrophically, so you do want to have good backups. Finally, we talked about file systems where we transform blocks into files and directories. We want to optimize for the access and usage patterns. We want to maximize sequential access, but also allow very efficient random access, since that's how we store things like our page files. And then finally, files and directories are defined by a header. In Unix, we call this an inode. Any questions? OK. Please make sure Kevin gets all the drives back, and uh, good luck on uh, next week's midterm. <laughs> <laughs>